Welcome back, my friends, to another episode of the Shema Podcast. I want to share with you something I've been contemplating as we approach Sukkos. But before we get started, I do want to make an ask. Once again, please rate and review the podcast. If you enjoyed, if you find it meaningful, it helps me get more exposure to the podcast. It'll help me bring on more guests. So I do appreciate that. Also, I would love to be able to not make our relationship one way. I would love to be able to hear your feedback. I made it easy. Go into the show notes. Click on the link to join the Small Podcast for the Perplexed WhatsApp group. Join a great community of fellow Jews so I can hear your feedback, get your input on ways I can make the show better. Okay, now to the topic at hand, Sukkos. Welcome to the Shema Podcast, the podcast for the perplexed, where Torah insights intertwine through personal stories, as well as interviews with leading Torah scholars, demonstrate the empowering qualities of Torah and mitzvot. For more great Torah learning through Torch, the Torah Outreach Center of Houston, go to torchweb.org. Now to the show. I was thinking a lot about various concepts I have learned over the years and bringing them all together so I can experience sitting in the sukkah with great meaning and creating an experience that will stay with me throughout the entire year. But I want to start by stating a sad reality, one that we together need to change. You know, if you ask people and you look at the polls I've seen, the majority of people say they believe in God, one God. Sounds great until sadly you look beneath the surface. I hate to be a Debbie Downer, a stickler, but this is true. And I'm mostly concerned about the majority of Jews who don't understand what I am about to say. So when someone tells you, I believe in God, and you ask them, well, define the God you believe in. Sadly, the definition they give will be of a guy that does not exist. I have found with so many Jews, including rabbis, who believe in the God that Pharaoh believed in. This is a God that created the world and then is independent of it, is not sustaining it, is not involved with it. This, of course, is what allowed Pharaoh to be God of this world in his own mind. I see so many Jews stuck in this. And sadly, when I've heard it from so many rabbis, I know why. To paraphrase Rabbi Natan, who was the primary disciple of Rabbi Nachman, he said, if someone were to wake up every day and say, I believe in God, I believe in God, I believe in God, until the moment they go to sleep, and they did this every day. However, the God they're saying they believe in is not a God that is sustaining the world in every moment, that is orchestrating every event, every precise event, encounter, everything that happens to us. Like as the Talmud says, when we reach in our pocket to grab a quarter and we get a dime, everything that's taking place is being orchestrated by him. If they do not believe the creator is doing this and doing it out of love to guide us, then he says they're an atheist because the God they are believing in does not exist. And so it crushes me when I think about that, that you, know, you start to get optimistic. Oh, wow, you believe in God. Fantastic. But then you find out that they're in fact an atheist because the God they believe in does not exist. You know, I read a great book before I became religious called The Elegant Universe by Brian Greene. I believe I'm remembering that title and author's name correctly. But he discussed in the book how everything that physicists were learning about the subatomic world up until... I guess the writing of this book, which is probably like 2000, 1999, somewhere in there, was that everything was smaller and smaller particles. Atoms are made up of neutrons and protons. Neutrons and protons are made up of quarks, etc., and so on. And they're all bound together by these forces of energy. 
the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, gravitational force, electromagnetic force. And the energy is what causes the particles to coalesce with each other to form everything around us. But by the late 90s, they had gotten to the point where they realized that the further you go down to the subatomic world, it's not smaller and smaller particles. It's fabrics of vibrating strings. It's vibrations. And different frequencies of vibrations are what cause everything in the world to come into existence. And I found this fascinating more so when I started learning Torah. And I learned that our infinite internal creator is brought the world into creation through speech. And what is speech? What is my speech right now? It's nothing more than me taking the air from my lungs, pushing it through the physical flesh of my mouth, tongue, teeth, lips to form sound. And what is that sound? It's vibrations. And I always check back in and look at where the physicists are holding and they're still stumped with what is the source of these vibrational frequencies. They're still trying to hammer away at an algorithm to figure out what's causing all this to occur. But we, of course, know why. The source of everything. I've seen some Kabbalistic literature, although it's been quite some time. I don't remember the source. Forgive me once again. With a Kabbalist used similar language to what modern physicists are using to describe Hashem's name the Yud, K, Vav, K, replacing the Hey with the K. And why do I do that? It's because we do not pronounce that name. We don't know the vowels to pronounce it. And we don't even say the letters one after another because it's just too powerful for us to tap directly in to the divine source in that way. So they were describing that the Yud, K, Vav, K represents those four energies that Hashem used to create all of reality, all of the physical universe. And this is why, my friends, that you'll notice that in the Torah observant world, you rarely hear someone use the word God. This is precisely why. is because the word God has so many definitions according to so many people. We say Hashem is what you hear typically. Hashem meaning the name. What is the name? The yud ke vav ke, The force of everything that brings everything into existence and is influencing everything and is a source of all power and all pleasure. And you're probably asking, Dan, you really gone off on a tangent here. What in the world does this have to do with Sukkos? Let me explain. And this probably explains why so many Jews who show up to their synagogues for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur do not observe the mitzvah of sitting in a sukkah because they don't understand what it's there to accomplish. When you look at Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkos, and use more metaphysical type terminology, I think it may give more clarity. You know, we talk about at Rosh Hashanah, crowning the king, that Hashem is the only ruler. He is the king. But on a different level, or maybe just using different terminology, what are we actually saying? We are coming into Rosh Hashanah and acknowledging that the source of everything, the source of all power, the source of all pleasure, the source of everything manifesting itself into existence is from our infinite creator, Hashem, yud Vavke. vav Ke. And then we go into the 10 days of Teshuva leading into Yom Kippur. And what are we doing then? We use this terminology about sinning, but let me phrase that in a way that I think makes more practical sense. Whenever we sin, what are we doing? We are assigning power or pleasure to something other than the creator. If we embellish a truth in a sales meeting, what are we doing? We are assigning power for our livelihood to 
our sales ability, the prospective client sitting in front of us, it's assigning power and a source of our sustenance from something other than Hashem. When we work on Shabbos, we are assigning power to something other than Hashem for our livelihood. When we fear anything other than the only power, we are assigning power to that other thing. That is a sin. When we are assigning pleasure to anything that's not kosher, then the opportunity cost of that is we're not assigning pleasure correctly to our creator. This is why the sexual blemish that is caused by improper sexual activity distance us so much from our creator because we're assigning pleasure to something that is not him. So what we did during this this time period from Rosh Hashanah, establishing our minds and saying, Hashem is the only source of power and pleasure. And then going through and looking at every moment in our previous year when we assign power or pleasure to something other than him, which is the same thing as what causes us to sin, then we are rectifying those errors, repairing ourselves. And then Hashem does that for us because he needs us to be reset and whole to fight another year for him. But then we get into Sukkos. And what are we doing? We're leaving our permanent homes and sitting in a sukkah. Fragile walls, a roof made of foliage, not the sturdiest construction. We're exposed to the elements, the temperatures. I know up in the Northeast, they complain about, so oh, it's going to be too cold. We would love to have a cold sukkah. I, I, you know, it's just like the latest it's ever been, you know, for all of us. So we were, we're so optimistic here in Houston. It's going to be nice and cool outside. Nobody's racing around trying to figure out how to create AC in their sukkah. So we're still hopeful. The verdict is out. It's a little warm today, but God willing, it will be nice this year. But we're exposing ourselves to the elements, the rain, the temperatures. We're leaving our permanent house. You know, I just recently moved into a new house. And it's easy to get caught up in the illusion that this is my security. The concrete foundation, the wood structure, the brick. I have stone, wood. Everything goes in. You feel secure. I'm secured from the world around me in my office here. But it's a false illusion. I mean, I think what we saw with the hurricanes in Florida, every now and then Hashem likes to show us just that. It's not a source of security. And so we go in the sukkah to remember that. The only security of any type for our safety, well-being, material needs, spiritual needs, it all comes from Him. The walls of the sukkah, halakhic, to be halakhically sound, have to have three of the four walls covered to have a shape similar to that, to an outstretched arm wrapped around like in a hugging embrace. You know, a lot of people think that many of these things we do in Judaism are symbolic in nature. You know, we sit in the sukkah to remind us things. It's symbolic, but it's not. It's much more deeper. It's metaphysical. The mitzvos are there to bridge what the physicists do not yet understand, that the true backbone of all of physicality, the cause of those different vibrations creating the fabric of all materiality, it comes from a spiritual source. So baked into creation was things that we don't quite understand. We don't yet have the math for. And one of them is, is that when we are sitting in the sukkah, it is there to infuse us with this amuna, this understanding. Hashem wants us to know as we go out into the year to not put our sense of security in our homes or our bank accounts or anything other than him. He wants us to trust in him alone for everything because that is the source, the true source of where we find all our physical blessings, all our security, all our spiritual blessings and insights and growth and clarity It all comes from him. And he doesn't want us going elsewhere. Because when we go elsewhere, we get led astray. They're false paths. They're dead-end streets. They don't get us anywhere. And he wants us to have a successful year. 
And that is the purpose of this mitzvah of sitting in the sukkah. You know, one of the things we do as well is we wave the luvlov. Hashem delegated to the Jewish people the mitzvah of these four species and waving the lulav in order to bring rain throughout the entire globe. We are responsible for feeding the world, not something I learned in Sunday school growing up. We are responsible for feeding the world. He put that on us. If there was no Jew waving a lulav, the Sukkos, there would be a global drought. And we do that. We take that responsibility seriously. Even for so many around the world that hate us, they will find out one day that it's because of us that they had rain, that they had produce growing from their fields to eat. It came from us. So I just wanted to share, my friends, this, this idea. It's an idea that we need to spread. It should not be with 25 to 35% of the Jewish people alone in a small group of B'nai Noachs. We have to get Jews to understand this. We have to get them to understand and correctly define their creator. We can't just cheer when we hear them say that they believe in God. We have to educate them on this. We need to invite them into our sukkahs and explain this to them. You know, I did a podcast with Tyler and Erica Scholl titled something like, we're all in Jewish outreach now. I forget, it's been a while. But the idea is that we have to be. I mean, those of us living in a Torah observant community that have lived here, think what it would do for all of Kalei Yisrael if everyone brought another Jew who is not familiar with Sukkos to bring them into their sukkah, to explain them and define God, the definition of Amuna, what it means. I mean, being a part of the Torch family where Torah is conveyed on a regular basis through the great rabbis at Torch, you know, as I found myself contemplating this sad reality, I realized like this is the primary thing that Jews need to learn around the world. If we can get them by this time next year, more Jews just to understand this reality, then it will have a considerable impact on the Jewish people overall in the world at large. You know, as I went through the Yom Kippur service, there was many times where I, many things that I read as like, I did this and I did this and I did this. I assigned power to something other than Hashem. But when we know the truth, we can realign ourselves and we need to help out our brothers and sisters do the same. So my friends, as we sit in the sukkah this year, let it empower us. Empower us with Amuna and knowing this reality and asking for Hashem's help to spread this reality and this true definition of of the Creator to more Jews and the world at large. I mean, this is our mission. This is our purpose for being in this world. It's the job we request at Rosh Hashanah. May we all this year have much spiritual growth, material growth, and be a light unto the nations. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider supporting Torch so they can continue to spread Torah wisdom to the world by making a donation at torchweb.org and clicking donate in the top right corner of the page. 